Good morning. I'm Dr. Peter Johnson, and we're just going to do an overview of chest imaging, focusing on the basics. Here are a few useful resources that you might find helpful. Uh, for example, Learning Radiology, which is a website, online website that uh, has some pretty good um, on-demand lectures on various topics in radiology. Let's just start off by mentioning that there are several imaging modalities. Right, which include chest radiographs, CT scans, nuclear medicine scans, etc. And the term modality refers to the type of test. Now, different types of tests may use different types of energy. For example, CTs and chest radiographs or general radiographs utilize X rays, while nuclear medicine may use gamma rays or positrons. MRI uses strong magnetic fields and ultrasound will use ultrasound rays. But we're going to focus on chest radiography today, right? And it's probably the most uh, common imaging investigation done for the various reasons listed here. I'm going to focus right now on how to evaluate the normal chest. So this is a normal chest radiograph, and when you're evaluating any radiograph or any imaging test, you need to treat it like an experiment. You need to first determine whether or not the image that you have here is of diagnostic quality in the patient of interest. So the first thing you need to do is identify the patient. This image is anonymized for the purpose of teaching, but there will be a nameplate or some identification marker on the film somewhere which will indicate the patient's name, their age, registration number, and other identifiers where, where um, necessary. There will be a side marker. It will tell you which side is left or right, and only the person who has done the image, who has done the film, meaning the radiographer or technician who took the film can tell you which side is right or left. So they will label the film to tell you which side is right or left. After that, we look at the technique. Now, in terms of imaging patients, it utilizes optics. So the x-ray setup is, is, is like this. You'll have an x-ray camera or x-ray tube. You'll have a detector or a cassette. And the direction that the x-ray travels is the projection. So for example, in this setup, this is the anterior part of the patient. That's the posterior margin of the patient. If the x-ray tube is right here, the beam is going anterior posteriorly. If it is posterior anteriorly, the x-ray tube is at the back, the cassette is at the front, and that's posterior anteriorly. Now, you need to know the projection. So this is a frontal projection, and the reason why we need to know this, know the type of projection, whether it is anterior posterior or posterior anterior, and let me just backtrack a little bit. Um, in terms of a frontal projection, a frontal projection can either be an anterior posterior or a posterior anterior projection. Now, the reason why you need to be able to distinguish between the two is because you measure something here called the cardiothoracic ratio, which is the widest diameter of the heart divided by the widest diameter of the chest, and it should not be more than 50%. If it is more than 50% in a properly uh, done x-ray, um, then you have cardiomegaly. But the thing is, it only works in a posterior anterior view, and I will explain why. You see, the cardiothoracic ratio is a linear equation, and therefore there's a constant involved, which is the magnification. So the magnification you use needs to be constant from film to film, from person to person. So let us look at magnification. So if you have a, let's start with a posterior anterior projection first. So in the posterior anterior projection, the cassette is at the front of the patient, the camera is at the back. And if you notice in this setup, if the cassette is here, the medius tenum is right, is the closest the medius tenum can get to a cassette in a living person. As a result of that, the magnification will be minimized. Just as a quick review um, of some basic optics, the further you are or the further your object is from the target or the screen, the more magnification you get. So if, for example, you put your hand against a wall and shine a light on it, the shadow you get on the wall or the silhouette you get on the wall is going to be the smallest in size with your hand closest to the wall as, as you pull the hand away from the wall, your the shadow of your hand will magnify. The same thing applies here. So in a posterior anterior projection, your magnification is going to be minimized. Also, the thickness of the chest wall doesn't vary. 
So from film to film, the magnification is going to be minimized as well as it will be constant. In an anterior posterior projection where the beam direction is this way, it's different. So the first thing you'll notice if the cassette is at the back here, the mediastinum is now further from that cassette and therefore will be magnified. The other thing as well is that this retrocardiac space here, when you take an inspiratory effort, this space varies. And therefore what will happen is that this, the distance of the mediastinum from the cassette will vary from inspiration and expiration as the patient breathes. And if you tell a patient to take a maximum inspiration and hold it in, which is what you ask them to do, to try to pull down the diaphragms as much as possible, you're going to find that they are not going to be able to do it exactly the same each time. So therefore, the magnification is going to vary um, from film to film. As a result of that, in an AP projection, the cardiothoracic ratio does not work. It's not accurate and it's not reliable. So you... The, the ideal film, as you can imagine, is going to be a posterior anterior projection. So, we've told you about the projection. The next thing we need to know is the position of the patient. Oh, um, so Vention, all frontal radiographs are PA or posterior anterior unless labeled otherwise. So that's an international convention. And that's the only way you're going to be able to tell, differentiate, sorry, a PA from an AP film is based on the labeling. All AP films would either have the word AP erect or supine um, printed on it. The next thing is the position of the patient. Are they erect or supine? Are they sitting up, standing, or are they lying flat? All right. All PA films are erect. And if it is an AP erect, you will see the label on it. If it's a supine, you will see the label on it. You can also tell by looking at fluid levels. The next thing is the centering of the patient. The patient needs to be dead center, right? The beam needs to intersect the patient at a perpendicular plane. So if the patient is rotated, for example, it will distort the image. And the simple way to test that is to draw a line connecting these dots. And these dots here are the spinous processes. So if you draw a line connecting those, that is your midline, and you measure the distance from the medial ends of the clavicles and that mid midline point, and they should be equidistant. If one side is wider, the patient is rotated. The next thing is the inspiratory effort. You want to pull these diaphragms all the way down, as far down as you can, right? So that you can see as much of the lungs as possible. And you assess the inspiratory effort by, com by counting the ribs. So these are the posterior aspects of the ribs here. As, and these are the anterior portions of the ribs which come down like this. So the ribs wrap around like that, okay? So five, five to eight anteriorly or nine to 11 posteriorly, and those are that, that rib count would be adequate for um, a good inspiratory effort. The next thing is that all parts of the image need to be on the film that you're interested in. If you cut off the APCs or the bases, then you can't evaluate those structures. If it's not on the film, you can't evaluate it. Last but not least is the exposure factors. The radiographer who takes the film is going to dial in some settings into the machine so that you get the best exposure. An X-ray beam is going to be consistent of two major there are two major characteristics of the beam there's the energy of the beam which is given by the kilovolts and there's the intensity of the beam which is given by the milliampere second so the more intense the beam is the more x-rays are in the beam the more power the beam is the more energetic the beam is now if you have a lot of power in that beam what's going to happen is that x-rays are going to fly through the body part and will not interact with the tissues to give you the inherent contrast which is necessary to see the various structures so what you need to have is a good balance of your power and intensity to give a well-exposed film. For a chest radiograph, an adequately exposed film is one in which you can see the lung markings. And these are the lung markings. These are blood vessels, right? You need to be able to see those lung markings where you need to see them, right? They don't, the lungs do not stop at the edge of the heart here or at the tops of the diaphragm. They wrap around the heart and go in front and behind the diaphragm. So you need to be able to see the lung markings, as you can see here, through the diaphragm. 
you to be able to see them through the heart and you should be able to see them all the way out to about a centimeter from the inner chest wall so there's a one centimeter a vascular band in other words you should not see any lung markings in about a one centimeter band at the lateral or the um, the, the most um, the most lateral aspect of the lung and that will be an adequately exposed film after that we get on to our anatomy so once you're happy that the film is adequately exposed we get on to the anatomy and there are various ways you can do this you can go from centrally out or from outside in i tend to go from centrally out it doesn't matter which way you go but the most important thing is that you follow the same routine all the time so here is the heart and the mediastinum we mentioned the cardiothoracic ratio already, which you should measure. And then you look at the mediastinal outline on the left side, you have the aortic arch or the aortic knuckle, a little bit of ascending aorta here, and then the left heart border here. At the top of the left heart border here, you see this first part of the slope represents the central pulmonary arteries and the rest of the left heart border represents the left ventricle. The right heart border is the right atrium. That's your mediastinum, and it should not be pushed from one side to the next. It should be nice and central. Here is your trachea. Right mean stem bronchus, left mean stem bronchus. Then you need to look at the pleura. Well, I go to the pleura next, which might sound a little bit strange, but the reason why I do that is that when I look at the mediastinal outline, I'm actually looking at a pleural interface already. So I just continue. So after looking at the mediastinum, I come down to the cardiophrenic angles, cardiophrenic angles, okay? The costophrenic angles, costophrenic angles, the surface of the diaphragm, I look along the lateral chest wall all the way around and I look through both um, hemithoraces and that will give me an evaluation of the pleura. After that, I come central again and I follow my lung markings out. They should branch like a tree, right? They should get, as they go further out, they should, the branches of the vessel should get smaller and smaller to about a centimeter from the inner chest wall, as we mentioned before, where you should not be able to see any normal lung markings. And after that, I look at my bony skeleton. So I look at the ribs, count them. I look at my clavicles. I look at the scapulae, the shoulder joint, if it is on it and any other bones that I can see, including the lower um, cervical spine. I look at the thoracic and lumbar spine if it is on the film. And then after that, I look at what are called extrathoracic soft tissues. So that is your supraclavicular supra fossae, your axillae, your lateral chest wall, and the subdiaphragmatic spaces. And after that, I'm pretty much done, right? You should practice doing that so that you become fluent just the same way when you examine, when you learn to examine someone's abdomen or their neurological system, there's a system that you should go through and you keep practicing it so that it becomes second nature. Now, there are various types of pathology and we're going to focus on that right now. And just for the interest of, of time, we won't be going through the chest x-ray in that methodical way that we just mentioned. You should practice doing that, but for the interest of time, I'm just gonna get on straight to the pathology. So let's start out central with the mediastinum first. So this is the normal chest. Remember, we showed you what the normal chest looks like. Look at this patient. You cannot see the normal aortic arch outline, as you can see here. It's sort of seen back here because uh, it's at the back, but don't worry about that right now. What's more important is you see this big lobular sort of uh, uh, thickening mass which blends with the heart silhouette, right? This is the normal left heart border. There's this big bulge here along the right side. It should be nice and, nice and sharp like this. You can see a bulge along here as well. This is the mediastinal mass or widening of the mediastinum. There's a differential for this and it can include several things including masses, uh, lymphadenopathy, for example, in the case in, in the case here, which represents Hodgkin lymphoma, but any cause of lymphadenopathy could do this. Other possibilities of a superior mediastinal mass, which is what this is, include uh, a goiter, which I'll show you an example, a goiter with intrathoracic extension, thymic mass, 
and a teratoma. Here's another example of a pretty large superior mediastinal mass, and this is a lateral x-ray showing the same pathology. Look at this one. There's widening of the superior aspect of the mediastinum or the superior mediastinum, but this swelling goes all the way into the neck, and you notice that the trachea is pushed by it, so it is related to the trachea. This is a goiter with intrathoracic extension, and here's a normal chest again for you to compare. So those are examples of mediastinal masses. Let's look at this one now. So it, when you look at this film, clear abnormality on the right side, you can see uh, soft tissue density, which obscures the right hemidiaphragm. It has a meniscus configuration here, and this is a right pleural effusion. When you look on this film, this one is pretty bizarre. First thing you notice is that the mediastinum is pushed all the way over to the left. The right hemithorax is much larger than the left. These are the breast shadows, by the way, so let's ignore those for now. It uh, gives an artifact to make down here look a bit, uh, the base look a little bit dense, but that's just because of overlap from the breast. But if you notice here, you can see normal lung markings here, but you don't see any lung markings here. There's a reason for this. This air is not in the lung, it is in the pleural space. So you, a pleural sp air in the pleural space, sorry, represents a pneumothorax. And with this mediastinal shift to the opposite side, this represents a tension pneumothorax. As you probably learned during your surgery clerkship, this is not, this diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis and really you shouldn't be asking for a chest radiograph to make that diagnosis. But you will get, um, you will be taught that in during your, your, your surgery rotation. Here's another example of a pneumothorax on the, on this left side, you can see your normal lung markings going all the way out to a centimeter from the inner wall of the chest. But if you notice here, the lung markings stop here. And you see an edge. And then air on the outside. So this is air in the pleural cavity. This is another pneumothorax. In this case, there is no um, midline shift. This is a simple pneumothorax. So let's get to the lung now. This is a normal chest again for reference. Now there are two types of lung pathology, right? There is airspace disease and then there's interstitial disease. And we'll speak a little bit about both. Airspace disease represents alveolar disease. The air density that we see in a chest radiograph, right, so dark density, is as a result of air in the alveoli. When there is no air in the alveoli, this air density disappears it becomes replaced by whichever density has gone into the alveoli. So for example, you could replace the air in the alveoli by fluid, pus, any type of aspirate, blood, right? So in other words, if you replace the air in the alveoli, you now have consolidation. So in consolidation, the air in the alveoli is replaced by something else. But you could just remove the air from the alveoli, and you can think of the alveoli sort of like a balloon. You could replace the air just altogether, and the, alveol the alveolus will just simply collapse. When that happens, then you have collapse. But when the alveolar, you remember the alveolar, the alveolus has a wall, which is a soft tissue wall. So when all the alveoli collapse in a certain area, what you're going to get is a basically a mass of um, deflated lung which also looks like soft tissue. The way you differentiate, therefore, between collapse and consolidation is whether or not there is volume loss. If the volume is preserved, then it's consolidation. If the volume is decreased, then it's collapse. So when you look here, there's no air here. Also, there are no lung markings in there. When you lose lung markings, you know that you're in the lung, the pathology is in the lung. So when you look here, there are no lung markings in this area here in the right upper zone, and there is no air. So you know you're dealing with airspace disease because first thing you know it is in the lung because there are no lung markings in this abnormal area. And secondly, you know it is airspace disease. Remember, there are two types of lung disease. There's airspace and interstitial. 
So in this case, no long markings, but there's no air. So you know you're dealing with airspace disease. Secondly, there is no evidence of volume loss, and I will show you examples of how what volume looks like when we get on to collapse. But there is no evidence of volume loss here at all. This is consolidation. So this, this uh, child has consolidation in the upper lobe of the right lung, and you can see an interference here with the horizontal fissure telling you that this is the upper lobe. Here is a smaller area of consolidation, right? And this one... Again, is in the upper lobe. You can see the horizontal fissure. Again, to look, you can see normal lung markings here, but you don't see any lung markings in this area at all, and there is no air. There is no volume loss, so therefore this is consolidation. Here's another example, right? There is decreased lung markings, decreased air, so this is an air, and there's well, you can't, well, there's this airspace disease, therefore, but if you notice that this obscures the right heart border, this is the normal chest hair for comparison. So the fact that it obscures the right heart border tells you where in the lung it is. This is not in the lower lobe, for example. This is in the middle lobe, because the middle lobe has a direct relation to the right heart border. All right, so this, because this area of airspace disease silhouettes or obscures the right heart border, you know it is in the middle lobe. And you should ask for a lateral film here because with the middle lobe collapse, it's very difficult for you to assess volume. So if you notice here, this is the area of consolidation. That's the horizontal fissure, the oblique fissure, and all of this is, um, you can see airspace changes here. So right middle lobe consolidation. And this patient again, if you notice, no air, no lung markings at all. The right hemidiaphragm is obscured. So this is in the lower low because it obscures the right hemidiaphragm. Okay, um, again, an air of consolidation. There's no volume loss. So it's airspace disease because there's no lung markings, no air. And there's no volume loss. So this is consolidation in the lower lobe of the right lung. Now we're gonna switch, switch pathologies now. If you notice here, no air in the right hemithorax, no lung markings, so you know you're dealing with airspace disease of some form. And you notice the trachea is pulled to that side. When the trachea is pulled to the side of pathology, you have volume loss all the time. Once the trachea is pulled toward the side of pathology, you have volume loss. So what has happened there is that you have collapse of the entire right lung. If you look here on the left side, normal lung markings, air in the lung. On this side, there's no air, and then there's volume loss telling you that this is collapse of the right lung. On this example, again, the normal film for you to compare to, you can see loss of air in the upper zone on this side, loss of air. And if you notice, the trachea is pulled slightly to the right side. The right hemidiaphragm is slightly elevated, but just the right hemithorax in general just looks a way smaller than the left. So you know that there is volume loss on this side. This is right upper lobe collapse. The right upper lobe collapses in a superior and paramedian um, uh, fashion. Right upper lobe collapse. This is left upper lobe collapse. The left upper lobe. With the, right, with the left upper lobe, if you notice what happens, when the left upper lobe collapses, it collapses onto the left heart border. So if you notice here, there is this airspace of pacification, there is no air, there are no lung markings, it obscures the, the left heart border, so you know it is in the upper lobe. If you notice the trachea is pulled a little bit this way, the aortic arch is pointing towards that left side. Com this is what it should be doing. It should be nice and straight up. It's pointing to that side. The left hemithorax looks smaller than the right, so this is collapse of the upper lobe of the left lung. On this one, if you notice, the right hemithorax is just smaller than the left. This is the normal chest to compare. So you know something has collapsed here. If you look closely, there is this sort of a wedge-shaped opacity here. Okay, this is left Sorry, this is right 
lower lobe collapse and it looks the same on the left so if you compare this to this it's it's the same so the the lower lobes collapse in a posterior paramedian location and it has a sort of a triangular type um, pacification here if you notice here there is obscuring of the right heart border there is decreased air their lung markings are gone right here they're abnormal at least you know there's ear space opacification if, if it obscures the right heart body you know it is in the middle lobe as we explained before in this case however you get a lateral film and you notice this appearance this is collapse of the middle lobe the middle lobe collapses like a clamshell so this is basically the horizontal and oblique fissure and this little area shaded in is a collapsed middle lobe now this film looks pretty bizarre if you look at this though, if you take a time and work through it, as you go through, you notice all of this air density here in the supraclavicular fossa, that is surgical emphysema, here in the axilla, uh, in the axilla as well. And you notice that this air tracks into the mediastinum. You notice you can see the outline of the entire aorta. You don't normally see that, you just see the left portion of the aorta most of the time, um, the upper portion of the Aorta, but you can see it all the way through the diaphragm. Look at that. You can see air tracking into the retroperitoneal spaces along here as well. Right? If you look closely, air again, a lateral aspect, right, the right margin, sorry, of the mediastinum. All of this represents mediastinum air in this patient with a pneumomediastinum. Uh, she also happens to have right lower lobe collapse again. And you can review the previous slides again to show you what that looks like. Remember, it has this sort of a triangular configuration. The right hemithorax is smaller than the left, etc. So moving on, this is a mass. This is a large left lung mass centered near the hilum. This is a bronchogenic carcinoma. Here are multiple nodules. These large nodules are called coin and cannonball lesions. And these are typical of renal cell carcinoma, but not exclusive, exclusively so. But if you see them, you should try to exclude renal cell carcinoma as they are the likely diagnosis in this scenario. These are metastases. Now, moving toward interstitial lung disease, if you notice this patient, the patient's heart is enlarged. You can measure the cardiothoracic ratio for yourself. There is some cephalic redistribution of the pulmonary vascular markings. Normally, the pulmonary vascular markings should be larger or more prominent in the lower zones compared to the upper zones. This cephalization is a feature of congested cardiac failure. But remember, you're supposed to be able to follow the lung markings out to about a centimeter for the in inner chest wall. And if you look at a magnified view here, you see all these little thin lines running along the outer surface of that lung. These represent septal lines or curly B lines in this patient with congested cardiac failure. So just to review, there's cardiomegaly, there's cephalization of those pulmonary art, um, vessels, as well as these septal lines or curly B lines, giving you a patient with congested cardiac failure. Obviously, you need to have the right clinical context as well. These changes represent interstitial changes, so if you, right? So um, this these changes lie in the interstitium, okay? More... Um, more, more, in more detail, the, or to be more precise, here is a subpleural interstitium. But this is another type of interstitial lung disease. If you notice normal chest here, you can see your lung markings going out, as we mentioned before, branching like a tree um, up to about a centimeter from the inner chest wall. But if you notice here, there are all these bizarre lines. You don't see any normal lung markings. You don't see normal lung markings, so you know that this is a lung pathology, but there is still air. So this is not airspace disease. So if you see abnormal lung markings, but there is still air, you're dealing with interstitial disease. This is interstitial fibrosis in a patient with sarcoidosis. Okay, finally, we're going to speak about computed tomography, right? Uh, computed tomography, or CT, uh, basically gives you... Um, multiplanar imaging 
right? So it gives you better tissue contrast in general. There's a so-called routine CT of the chest, which you give intravenous contrast media. Um, there is a CT angiogram, which includes this aortic angiogram or the pulmonary angiogram or coronary angiogram. This is predominantly to look at the aorta and its branches. This is to look at the pulmonary arteries, for example, in pulmonary embolism. And the coronary arteries when you need to evaluate this, for example, in patients with ischemic heart disease. And then if you want to look at the lung alone, particularly for interstitial lung disease, there is a high resolution CT scan. Now CT, like with MR and other types of digital imaging, right, you use large data sets. There's a concept of windowing which allows you to set various imaging parameters so that you can look at various types of structures. So for example, if you want to focus on lung, there are these lung window settings. If you want to look primarily at bone, there are bone window settings, soft tissue, soft tissue settings, and so on. But remember, it utilizes pretty high doses of radiation and commonly utilizes contrast media, both of which can pose risks to the patient. So we may need to be mindful about doing CT scans, making sure that there's a good indication to do, to do them. Now, what I would like you to uh, be more aware of are the indications for CT scans. Um, you are not likely to be required to be able to interpret CT scans in your junior clerkship but certainly you need to know the indications for CT scans. And one way to, to go through this or to memorize it pretty easily is to divide um, the indications into urgent or emergency indications and elective in the in, uh, investigations. So in the setting of emergencies, you have traumatic and non-traumatic emergencies. And in the setting of trauma, whether it is penetrating trauma or blunt injury, the main reason for doing CT is when you have suspected mediastinal or great vessel injury. So whether it's penetrating or blunt, if you suspect mediastinal or great vessel injury, then a CT is, is, is indicated. In the non-traumatic emergencies, it's predominantly vascular, again, in suspected aortic dissection or, ruptured or suspected ruptured, ruptured aortic um, aneurysm, pulmonary embolism. Um, outside of the vascular tree, there are some settings, for example, if you suspect, if the, on a chest x-ray you see something that looks like a lung abscess, but it could also be an empyema and you're not quite sure which it is, a CT will help to differentiate. And the reason for needing to do so on an urgent basis is that lung abscesses are treated with antibiotics generally, so in other words, in a conservative manner while pleural empyemas are treated surgically. They're, they're treated by surgical drainage, by putting in a, a chest tube. So if you look here, this is an example of a patient with a pulmonary embolism. This is the axial or axial source image. This is a coronal multiplanar reconstruction. What this means is that you take all of the axial images from the scan that is done, um, put, to, put them together digitally and re-slice them in the coronal plane, which gives you this image. Nonetheless, this is the pulmonary trunk, right pulmonary artery, left pulmonary artery. This is the right side. This is the left side by convention. Um, this is the ascending aorta, descending aorta. This is your vertebral body at that level. That's your sternum, the ribs, scapulae along the side, the chest wall. Right mean stem bronchus, left mean stem bronchus. This is your superior vena cava. So, and this is your esophagus behind the uh, carina. So if you look here within the pulmonary trunk and the right and left pulmonary artery are these dark things here. These are called filling defects. These represent clot within the pulmonary arterial tree. You can see them on the coronal reconstruction. This is the right pulmonary artery. It's upper and interlobar branch. And you can see clots spanning the bifurcation here as well as here. These are called saddle emboli in this patient with pulmonary embolism. This is a case of an aortic dissection. So if you look here, this is your ascending aorta, descending aorta, again sternum, vertebral body, that's anterior, that's posterior, that's right, that's left, right lung, left lung. And if you notice here, this, this is the left pulmonary artery, but within the aorta, the ascending aorta and descending aorta, within the ascending aorta, you can see this flap. This is an intimal flap in this patient with an aorta dissection. If you notice, the dissection only involves the Ascending aorta, it does not involve the descending aorta. This is a Stanford A 
type error to this section. But outside of the emergencies and urgent indications, there's a wide list of elective indi indications. And these include, as mentioned here, and this list is by no means exhaustive. You happen to do a chest X-ray on a patient for some reason, you see a suspicious uh, lung nodule. Um, you might see a mediastinal mass, pleural mass. In patients who have cancers, um, established cancers, it's utilized as a part of a, of, of a screen, of a staging protocol, for, um, 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 excuse me, as a staging protocol. We're evaluating congenital abnormalities, evaluation of interstitial disease, amongst many others. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell, right? I'd like to uh, thank you for uh, listening to this uh, lecture. And if you have any questions. <laughs>